Our scripture lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, in this moment of proclamation, we ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and prayers of all our hearts would be acceptable not only this day, but every day. In the name of Christ, amen. I almost gave this sermon another title. And I'm still not sure that it's the right title. So I'm going to try out the second title on you and see what you think about it. Just to see. I almost called it, thank you, more please. Thank you, more please. Now the reason I didn't call it that was because in talking with a friend of mine, she said, you know, there are going to be some people in your congregation who are going to remember the movie Animal House. Obviously, there are people in the congregation who remember the movie Animal House. I had to go back and look at the clip to see what she was thinking about. And in the movie Animal House, which is a really raunchy comedy classic about frat boys and all of the antics that they get up to, the classic comedian John Belushi, the legendary John Belushi, engages in a scene where there is hazing happening. Now, mind you, we do not condone hazing, but part of the response that the young pledges have to give when they are receiving their hazing paddling is, thank you, sir, may I have another? And my good friend said to me, don't call that sermon, thank you, more please, because there will, it will just confuse people. So, I stuck with the title, Bringing It All Together, A Disciple's Life. But somewhere in my heart of hearts, I really want us to say thank you, more please. Why is that? Well, it's because this morning we're talking about Paul's letter to the Romans that wonderful treatise in which he outlines God's gift of grace and its effect on human, humanity's life, and indeed its effect on all creation. Romans is the epistle which contains the wonderful words from chapter 8 reminding us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not things that are living or dead, nothing that is seen or unseen, not even death itself. Romans is also the epistle that contains the reminder that there is therefore no condemnation for those who find themselves in Christ Jesus. And Romans contains the words we have just heard, that since we have been justified, how much more shall we be saved through God's life? Raise your hand if you have ever had questions about the blood of Jesus. Raise
raise your hand if by chance when you grew up there were people who said, I am going to pray the blood of Jesus over you. Were you ever one of those people who thought, I don't know if I really want to talk about the blood of Jesus? It's a messy construct. So why in the world would Paul put this in here in the midst of this wonderful treatise on God's grace and the privileges of God's grace? Well, go with me for a moment back to your bullfinch's mythology days. You know, remembering the Roman pantheon of gods, the Greek pantheon of gods, and probably the Norse pantheon of gods. This is a time in human history when human beings only know how to interact with God in transactional ways. Indeed, in these times, there is a God for everything and a God for everybody. And every God demands a transaction. Every God demands a sacrifice. This is a time when human beings in one way only know how to relate to their gods through the transactions and through the sacrifice. And strangely enough, as we come to the late 21st century and we are talking about things like prosperity theology, it's very interesting to me that in the midst of God's gift of grace to us, we are somehow finding ourselves drifting back to this kind of transactional theology where we feel as if we only get something from God if we give something from God, and if God is demanding sacrifices from us. Now, why is this so important, particularly when it relates to the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus? Atonement theology is and has been a major strain in Christian theology for quite a long time, the idea that somehow it has, something has to be paid for, that the fracturing of creation which alienates us from ourselves, alienates us from God, and alienates us from creation can only be repaired by a blood sacrifice. But friends, in that, pre in that time of antiquity, this was how that community would have believed what Paul was saying. In other words, a God who didn't demand a sacrifice, a God who didn't want anything from you, was probably a God who didn't have the power to give you anything. And because living in a transactional relationship meant that was the only way that those persons in those cultures could contain the elements and make sense of their lives, it became extremely important to know what it meant that Jesus had died and that blood had been shed. If you've never heard it before, let me be the first to say to you, that is not where we live in our understanding of God's grace and our evolution. Thanks be to God that we do have the rest of the story in Romans 5, that it is not only the death of Christ which enables us to enter the disciples' life, but it is, most importantly, the resurrected life of Christ that gives us the option to receive the Spirit's power and Spirit's grace in our life that enables us to become and live as true disciples. We are saved not just through Christ's death, but we are saved and called, more importantly, through Christ's life. And this, my friends, is at the core of a disciple's life. Here's what Eugene Peterson says in making this paraphrase in the message. God wants us to know that we are never shortchanged. Quite the contrary, there are not enough containers to hold everything that God so generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. And just stop and think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of this amazing friendship and resurrection life with God. 
In fact, it makes us want to sing. The core of the disciples' life, in other words, is not a life that is narrowly focused on what we have to give up in order to get something from God. The core of the disciples' life is focused on what God has opened to us through our relationship in Christ, the Holy Spirit. The core of a disciple's life is this core of inner character which Paul talks about that enables us to meet our troubles, to meet our challenges, and to overcome them, not through our own strength alone, but through the strength of Christ in us. It also enables us to develop those core competencies, which you and I sort of know as the fruit of the Spirit. It enables us to meet each day with the attitude that says, thank you, more please. Thank you, God, for the gift of grace. More, please. Thank you, God, for the gift of patience. More, please. Thank you, God, for the gift of compassion. More, please. Thank you, God, for the gift of being able to develop as a human being, uniquely express creation of your word and your intention. More, please. In other words, my friends, day by day, you and I as disciples are called not just to become people who are grabbing, but people who are giving out of the overflow, out of the abundance of grace and gifts that we have received. This is how we are going to change our world. This is how we are going to live into our mission statement of making disciples for the transformation of the world. This is how we are going to turn some situations around that are in desperate need of God's grace. Because you and I are going to stop living transactionally and we are going to begin living gracefully. Grace fully operative in us. Thank you. More, please. Second, as we develop this ability to become transformation people and transformative people in our communities and in our congregations, we are going to begin to see God's abundant grace operate in the lives of those who have not yet heard this message. There are people who are still not understanding that God does not require us to sacrifice in order to receive God's love. What God asks us to do instead is to surrender to that inevitable force of grace that we've been discussing over the last five weeks, the prevenient grace that is the magnet that attracts us the sanctifying grace which allows us to align our lives with God's intention, the perfecting and cleansing grace that allows us to grow in spiritual maturity and to be Christ-like. We will be like people who learn a new trade we will be people who are apprentices of grace, who make other apprentices of grace, who go on to make other apprentices of grace, who in turn make apprentices of grace all over the world and carry out the work of Christ. As we read through Paul's words and as we read through the Gospels, as we prepare to think about what it means to be good stewards of God's resources, and as we think about Advent, when we will welcome and celebrate the birth of the Savior again, it's important that we realize that this welcoming is a welcoming that gives us more. More of an opportunity to be church. More of an opportunity to share ministry. 
more of an opportunity to open our doors, more of an opportunity to create programs, have classes, create groups, and create spaces where people come to understand they are truly created by a God who loves them best. And as we prioritize these relationships and communicate this gospel of thank you more, please, our life as disciples will grow. Our inner spiritual lives will grow and develop, and we will begin to understand and become people who flourish. But more than that, our communities will grow. Young people who are wanting to know, is there something more than just transactional religion will have a resounding yes. Persons who are homeless and who want to know, is there a place where they can not only find dignity, but where they can be restored with healthy spirituality will hear a resounding yes, there is a place for you. And while we may not be perfect, we will certainly make mistakes. Our striving for perfection in this healthy way, this way of thank you more, please, will indicate to all who come to this church that here is a place where we are committed to living as people of the way. That's what the first disciples were called. They were not called Christians. That came later on. And the word Christian, meaning little Christ, was introduced by an outside culture. But the first disciples who lived that disciples' life called themselves people of the way because they saw themselves as people who were not only following a spiritual way, following a path, following a set of practices, but they saw themselves as literally walking in the way of Jesus, the only one who we have known who was able to contain both the fullness of our humanity and the fullness of God's beautiful div divine, divine nature. It is that walking in the way that shapes and reshapes what it means for us to be a disciple. And Paul has spent intense time trying to explain this, but this morning I hope that we will take more time not just to hear it as an explanation in our heads, but that we will allow the Spirit of God to make it come alive in our hearts. For as it moves from head to heart to hands, those five practices that we talk about from week to week that show up on our bulletin, that are written on our website, that are in various places in our building will become more than just language to us. They will become our means of living and working and walking in the way as we live the disciples' life. Therefore, Paul says, we are boast. We boast in nothing except God's goodness and God's glory to us. Because we realize that to boast in God's goodness, to boast in God's grace, to boast in God's faithfulness to us is another way of simply saying, thank you, God, more please. I hope that in the weeks to come that you will feel empowered by grace. I hope in the weeks to come that you will feel empowered to grow in grace. And I hope that in the weeks to come you will feel empowered and encouraged to participate in the way of grace that you will live as a person of transformation because you understand and have accepted for yourself the disciple's life. There is more to come. There is more to do. There is more to give. And we have all we need 
if we can but say, thank you, more please. Amen. <laughs>